I'm Keith McCullough, and welcome to another Real Conversation. First Real Conversation that I've done as um, RoboCop or something like this, and first one I've ever done from my uh, home office, which is nice. So getting to do that, uh, of course, with Chris Whalen. Chris, thank you for uh, making the time. Let's just start right up the middle on it. You know, the Federal Reserve now, you know, just using I'm just using market expectations as their price today, seven rate hikes into... Yeah. Into what I you know, what I think is a slowdown. I think we can have a debate about that if we don't agree. But but you know the Fed has never really tightened you know that many times. Never mind at all into you know the wrong side of the cycle. Credit you know seizing up you know in terms of how credit markets have traded the last you know three or four weeks, et cetera. What do you think about that? I agree with you. I think we're already seeing a slowdown. Housing has gone from a big positive to kind of a negative. We're going to see huge layoffs this year in housing finance. And I think that the Fed is a year behind the curve. So they're going to be trying to tighten while the economy is, is slowing. That's a problem. I also think they don't really have the tools, they think they do, uh, to manage a reduction in the balance sheet, uh, which is the big question mark. You know, the rate target for Fed funds, I don't think it matters. Hey there, Hedgeye Nation, or if you're not part of Hedgeye Nation, thanks for watching Hedgeye on YouTube. If you haven't already, make sure to click on the button below there. Subscribe to our YouTube page. You can also follow the link in the description to our website to get even more great investing content. Uh, can you, can you, not everybody understands what that means. And, you know, and, I, and we do have a broad audience, and I do think it's incumbent upon us. You know, I'll play for the league minimum. You and I have been around for a while. But, you know, people get highly paid to, to I'd say, obfuscate, you know, you know things uh, when they can be simplified. What does that mean per, you know, precisely? Well, the Fed really departed from past practice when they started to massively purchase uh, both Treasury securities and mortgage-backed securities. And they did this because rates were already so low. They didn't feel like they had any tools to pursue the mandate, i.e., full employment. We talk about price stability, but the whole point of Humphrey Hawkins, which was a largely socialist compromise put in place by Congress in the 70s, uh, is about job creation and full employment. Because they wanted to give people government jobs in the 70s. This was the compromise. So, you know, now the Fed has got a problem in that they've already compromised their independence, and they also have this huge balance sheet, which is the most significant factor in the bond market now. They own half of the mortgage securities produced over the last two years. So, and we turned over half of the U.S. book, by the way. We did six trillion dollars worth of mortgages. So, so, you know, the 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 long and the short of it is, is that the important part of Fed policy is how they manage their balance sheet, not what they say about the target for interest rates. That's what well, people should take away. Well, and, and how how they how they time and target the rate hikes so do uh, obviously impact how those markets that they created are trading. Uh, let's, go, let's go through that, maybe top, you know, the big markets first and then get into some rabbit holes. Cause I think where the rabbit holes where you, you obviously have a lot of expertise and you have a lot of, a lot of yeah. different. The housing ghetto, that's right. <laughs> I remember that. <laughs> you know, it's very important, but it's also, you know, very much discriminated against in the credit markets because these are finance companies. You know, they do really well when the sun is shining and there's moisture like flowers in, you know, Texas in the spring. But then when you have a recession and volumes fall, they disappear. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's the nature of, uh, of a capital, uh, capitalist society, a market-based society. And we're very fortunate that housing helped us for two years. But now, unfortunately, the Fed stimulated housing so much and home prices have gone up so much as a result of their manipulation of the credit markets that we are gonna have, I think, a challenge managing the way back. We can't really go back, but if we wanna try and get to something more normal and more stable, uh, it's gonna take some time, it's gonna take years. I mean, how do you, um, on the big stuff, uh, how do you do that without the big players on the sell side taking on real risk? Well, that's a big issue, Keith. Um, the street, the primary dealers have not tended to wanna to take a lot of risk. Uh, the ones that are part of large banks are constrained by Basel and they're constrained by the liquidity rules that have been put in place by U.S. regulators. So there have been times like December 2018, September uh, you know, 2019, 
when the credit markets just seized up. There wasn't enough liquidity. And this is when they were trying to shrink the balance sheet gently, just a little bit. But what you got to remember is that the, the problem with quantitative easing is that you can't stop. It's like heroin. Um, when you stop buying government securities and the treasury has to sell that bond to somebody else, a bank deposit disappears that was created earlier by the Fed. So the banking system naturally shrinks when the Fed is reducing their balance sheet. This also forces banks, by the way, to stop keeping their required cash in reserves at the Fed. They have to start buying T-bills and bonds. So it has a structural aspect as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, do you think that, um, like, let's just say that this, you know, starts to come unglued at a faster rate. Uh, mm. Do you think that this Federal Reserve, you know, just by virtue of how you define it, you said all that really matters is what's going on in the balance sheet. Do you think that they now have to reorient and be the leader on who needs to be on the buy and the sell side of, of, of where they need people to be or not? Well, that's the implication of the standing repo facility. If the street won't provide the liquidity, then they will. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's an important point because again, if the street is not willing to both serve as a market maker for treasury debt and trade other types of securities that they have to support as dealers, um, then you start to have liquidity problems. The big banks have no problems with liquidities. They're, they're islands of cash. They don't even have to deal with other people. They could just deal with their own customers. Uh, but it's the smaller firms, the smaller non-banks, REITs, things like that, that get into trouble when you have liquidity problems. And that's what happened in April of 2020. We, we had several large publicly traded REITs almost tip over because mm -hmm. the Fed had ridden to the rescue, right? Uh, the street basically had everybody's cash for 30 days. Well, no one had any cash. I mean um because you're right i mean so so diamond's balance sheet or his liquidity is gargantuan relative to the buy side i mean the, we basically just shifted it i think i mean and yeah. tell me if this is over oversimplifying it but you know the last financial crisis you had you know the, the the illiquidity was on the sell side now it's all on the buy side and the buy side has been promised by the fed which is neither the buy side or the sell side that it's all good because there's a fed put or you know is, it, is so that a fair side, way to characterize that? The buy side's overextended, Keith. You know, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, they, they have reached and reached for yield because the Fed was taking yield away from them. Exactly. You know, yeah, but, when, but when I tell side, people that 2019 is where we start with bank earnings this year, they look at me funny. But yeah, the yeah. fact is we lost $40 billion every quarter in gross interest income for banks. It's right. gone. So we yeah. got to rebuild that and it will take longer for asset prices yields to rise than it will take for funding costs to go up. So it's the opposite of what we had for the past two years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's it's um, it's interesting because, again, so many people are debating how many rate hikes, how many rate hikes can that happen into a slowdown? I mean, I, I basically say that every day. Uh, then you, and then somebody like you is like, no, 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 like, let's be for, you know, uniquely and, and focused on the Fed's balance sheet. And then we're going to try to get the buy side to do things that the Fed's balance sheet under QT wouldn't support doing unless they say they're going to engage yeah. in what would be a new QE, wouldn't it be? I mean, if they're if they're the ones that has to, to provide liquidity, that's not QT. No, but you see, that's the issue. Short term, they may have to come back. Right. If I if I could tell Chairman Powell what to do, I would just say, look, get Fed funds up to one percent and just let it sit there and then focus on the balance sheet, right. focus on liquidity, because it's not like, you know, I know we have an inflation issue, but I don't think you're going to have any problem dampening consumer activity and overall economic activity over the next couple of years. Hmm. Uh, this mess in the Ukraine uh, is going to cause terrible problems around the world. Uh, you're going to have people in Egypt and Africa who aren't going to have anything to eat. Uh, you're going to have serious economic problems in Europe. They can't produce fertilizer without natural gas, Keith. You know, uh, yeah. that's the bottom line. So I think we should be sensitive to the fact that I totally agree with you. Capital letters. OK, we are going into a slowdown. So the Fed should focus on, you know, getting rid of the quantitative easing part, the balance sheet. And don't worry too much about, put, you know, Fed funds up to four or five. You've seen some of the projections. 
No, it's not going to happen. Not going to happen. I mean, you know, we get it up to two. I would be astounded. Yeah, that's I, I I I have the exact same thought. I mean, when you think about what the market's already pricing, and guys, if you could show an updated slide sixty four. Um, this is showing you just a very basic leading indicator, which is tens minus twos, Chris, OIS, mm -hmm. one year forward. That curve's already inverted. I mean, you have, so again, what the market's priced in on the front end of the curve is pricing in at least some pretty classic, you know, not outright recession signals. If I say that, you're going to have a bunch of wonks pipe up. Oh, I know that that's not really every time the case. That's not the point. It's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's the economy is slowing. Like we had the economy actually slowing from 7% sequential in the fourth quarter where we didn't have these European problems to inside of 1% here within one quarter. I mean, so the bond yeah. market has figured out the rate of change of the economic risk, right? Whereas the Fed's trying to catch up to almost play some cover your ass game on inflation, right? You agree with that? But if, right. But if you layer an international perspective on top of what you just said, look at swaps. The right. same thing is going on. Yeah. I mean, we've we pulled four or five year swaps down 100 basis points below the curve. So what it tells you is there's vast demand for dollars and there is still vast demand for dollar collateral. But the Treasury is not making as much anymore. You know, mm -hmm. we're not building back America. That's done. Done. Um, Gini May issuance overall agency issuance is falling. So there's not enough collateral out there. And collateral is part of liquidity. It's yeah. not just cash. If I can't yeah. borrow bonds when I need them for a swap or something, then I have a problem, right? So. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 these are these are issues like you point out really only matters, you know, as Buffett would say, you only see who, you know, Munger or both, you know, you only see who's naked when the tide rolls up. But I mean, it's from my perspective, I always explain it very simply. When the rate of change of the economy is accelerating, you can do the stupidest shit you've ever seen anyone do, lever yourself up, get illiquid, have no collateral, no cash flow, and the market's actually going to create bubbles out of that. When the economy slows and it slows at a faster rate, then all the liquidity and collateral issues appear. I mean, you said that. I just want to say it kind of like in hedge I speak so that people understand that because people walk around, you know, almost lighting their hair on fire with the amount of debt, the deficits, the government spending, et cetera, but they... They get the market wrong all the time because they don't get the difference between when that matters during an economic deceleration and when it doesn't matter. In fact, you do the opposite, which is during an acceleration. On the deceleration, that's my question. It's like, OK, let's play this out a bit. The Fed is there to provide liquidity. That's number one. It's, you know, like you could take the, the price stability and full employment and, you know, stick it where the you know, sun doesn't shine. I mean, the third leg of that stool is market liquidity. Where's the S&P? Where's high yield trade? I mean, those to me, I have a lot of clients, Chris, and a lot of people that are in the queue that are going to ask questions about this that mm. don't believe that that's true. The Fed is going to stand there and just fight inflation throughout the year, no matter what happens to credit markets, no matter what happens to the stock market. And I, I get, I kind of get a little fired up about it, if you can't tell. <laughs> oh, well, no, but you're right. I, I knew Paul Volcker. He was a dear family friend. And he operated in a different time. Um, he could, you know, run the central bank with minimal interference from Congress or anybody else. They were afraid. Uh, today, this cowed and completely intimidated Federal Reserve Board has basically traded away the family silver. They allowed the Treasury to tell them what to do, which violates the accord that was put in place during the Korean War. That was the, basically how the Fed got their independence back after keeping interest rates stable for the whole uh, World War II period. So, you know, I think that it's a shame. Yellen did this, by the way. Janet Yellen, in my estimation, is the most radical and, and frankly incredible uh, public official we've ever had at the Fed. She's done enormous damage to that institution. Now, do you think, I mean, and so let's just bring it full circle again. Thank you for bringing her up. We're only 15 minutes in and me screwing up the intro to this conversation. Yeah. But Backer. again, what do I know? I am not I am not an entitled establishment economist. So I play for the league minimum. I am. Uh, but I am here to say that if the shit hits the fan economically and credit trades anywhere close to where it's been trading for the last three or four weeks, this isn't like new. Um, she stands ready with MMT on the switch next to the Fed. We haven't even seen that part of the movie. Like, how the hell does somebody think there's going to be seven rate hikes 
and quantitative tightening when she's standing ready there ahead of a midterm election? Uh, I think that's right. And the thing is, though, I, I think the bridge between Yellen and Powell has been burned. And as soon as he is confirmed by the Senate, I believe he's going to do what other Fed chairmen do, which is defend the institution. You know, really? never forget that William McChesney Martin was picked, uh, you know, by the White House to do what they wanted him, and he didn't do it. He ended up defending the central bank. So, you know, why, I think Powell will do the same thing once he doesn't have to worry about Capitol Hill anymore. So, why do you, um, why do you think that, that's 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 a new? I haven't heard that before. But why do you think um, the bridge was burned and 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 that it will be abandoned? Like, when did that happen? Uh, early in the process, when he was renominated by Joe Biden, Yellen kind of was unwilling to support him and then actually threw him under the bus when she thought he might be in trouble. So, you know, Washington is a funny town, Keith. I grew up in Washington. And when you do that, people remember. OK, well, that'll be interesting. Um, so, so that would imply that he doesn't play ball and that we don't get MMT. Uh, I would think not. I think there's still enough of a conservative tendency at the Fed, despite some of the crazy things they've done, uh, that they won't go that far because they don't have the legal authority to do it. You mm -hmm. know, when you could make an excuse for quantitative easing in the name of fighting COVID or something like that, okay. But if you start explicitly monetizing all of the Treasury's issuance, we're a banana republic then. We're in big trouble. And the dollar goes bye-bye. So I think they understand the difference between those two things. Um, hopefully we won't have another extraordinary experience like COVID anytime soon. Okay, so if he goes back to, I think that's an excellent point that you're one of the few people that'll make that point. Um, but let's, so let's go back to the scenario analysis where the economy slows, s and is now down 20% instead of where it just bounced from down 13. Yeah. And you know, high yield spreads instead of 400 over are approaching 500 over on high, mm -hmm. high yield OAS. You know, what it, what would you tell Powell to do, first of all? And what do you think he'll do? And are the, those the same things? <laughs> well, I think they've already told us what they're going to do with targets. They're going to stick to the meeting schedule. So if they can bump a quarter point at each scheduled meeting, I think that's what they'll do this year. Um, there's no reason to go any faster because, frankly, the credit markets, you know, what they're not. The problem of inflation is mostly caused by external factors that we didn't have two years ago. OK, that's their issue. And they still believe this. The Fed is not willing to admit that inflation's not going to come down. They're still hoping it will. All right. But then I think, you know, the real issue is how do we deal with this balance sheet? Um, if collateral gets really tight. Should we sell? Answer, yes. You know, use the markets. If the markets are well bid for Ginnie Mays, give it to them. Yep. Because, you know, that's the whole point. They need to understand that the dealers have a very limited appetite for risk. So if Treasury, for example, is in the middle of a funding and then we have problems somewhere, a surprise, you know, SoftBank files bankruptcy in Japan or something, you know, something like that is going to happen. You're going to have credit events rippling through the system because of Russia, mm -hmm. stuff that we're not expecting. You're mm -hmm. going to have payment interruptions that are going to cause defaults that we're not expecting. And you'll see this in bank results, by the way. There's, we can't even see the risk because it's so, it's so deep in the system, but it's going to bubble up to the surface. Mm -hmm. uh, we're restructuring a lot of commercial real estate right now, but nobody sees that because it's going on in a conference room with a bunch of lawyers. So. <laughs> You know, there's a lot of stress on the system now, and I think the Fed's going to be sensitive to that. They're in no hurry. The, mm -hmm. the big challenge they have is if they say, I want the balance sheet to go down this much, well, prepayments on Ginnie Mays are going to be in single digits soon. Yeah, I mean, they, I, think it was, um, I think it was March the 9th, which is, I, I lose track of the days and the weeks, um, but that was last week, I believe, uh, <laughs> that uh, probably the easiest thing to fact check on me, whether it was or not. But March the 9th was the last day of net, you know, bond buying by the Treasury. So you right. go from and you go you go from that to where you're going to be economically. And if your if your case is for not going beyond that and actually tightening the quantitative tightening of the balance sheet, mm -hmm. then. You, you're, are you saying that if, if the economic conditions and market conditions, most importantly, support it, i.e. spreads are blowing out and markets aren't trading, 
that they'll go back to incremental easing from the elimination of the bond buy? No, I, I think they'll try other things like, you know, just dumping liquidity in the short end. I don't think they want to you know, go out and buy more mortgage-backed securities right now. That's not a good idea. They're going to have those bonds for 15 years. So, you know, to me, they'll try other things. If that doesn't work, they'll go back to the old saw. I agree with you there. Right. Well, well, I mean, the, the, the old things are always new things, right? I mean, it's whoever's... <laughs> right? I mean... Yes. So if well, you're economists. Like, These are people who use their imaginations as part of their work, so... Well, I mean, I was going through, you know, Josh Steiner works with me and he, he um, I keep going through this in the morning meeting, trying to understand the Russian default, like technical or not. I mean, assets are seized, cash flows have stopped. This is a credit event. OK, yep. um, you know, like you said, you don't I mean, the dominoes are manifest. But, you know, whatever the new thing is, if the Fed has to provide liquidity, that's that's going to be whatever the new thing is. It's an old it's, it's going back to the old way, but to the new things. Yeah, it is. But I think, you know, the difference is, is that having gone through 18 and 19 um, and also 2020, the Fed knows that the system, the old Anglo system where monetary policy flowed through the big banks doesn't work anymore. Um, so they're going to a more European system where you have the central bank essentially standing in the middle of the market prepared to provide liquidity. Mm -hmm. And they will. There was a bailout set up in uh, April 2020 for a couple of large non-banks. It didn't happen. I had this actually confirmed to me by uh, uh, an old friend, Mark Calabria. So, you know, the stresses on the system as the volatility has increased have been greater. And this is largely due to the Fed. Quantitative easing, in my view, increases market volatility. Well, it so does. We, I mean, you know. Can you go, okay, I, I, I think I, I have my own uh, ideas on why. Why is that? I think it's partly because you're taking away the easier risk-free assets and you're forcing people into more volatile assets. Mm -hmm. You're also tending to force them into the equity markets too. If they can't raise money in the debt markets, they'll go raise equity or private equity, even better, right? So it's tended to fuel a speculative environment because rates are so low. There is no natural yield on the book anymore, right? So you've got to get all of your return off of capital gains. Yep. You know, just right. sitting there owning securities is not good. And this is particularly interesting, Keith, in my neck of the woods, mortgage servicing. You have all these funds that have been buying Ginnie Mae servicing, not thinking that about a third of those COVID loans that were uh, re you know, structured and uh, pooled again, uh, modified in many cases, are going to default again. And when delinquencies go up, the cost of servicing those loans is going to be very high. You may not even make money. A lot of people don't understand this. So they went into assets that normally they wouldn't buy. Right. Well, That's I mean, it's a natural thing. And, you know? <laughs> and, it's, and it's not just like when people hear that, you know, and, and by the way, it's true. It's just not a well-rounded thing that they're hearing. They're, they'll say, okay, I mean, I'll agree with it. I'll say, okay, look, if you if you create free money forever, you're going to create a crypto bubble. You're going to create a TAM stock bubble where you're financing whatever private equity or venture to get that side of the trade. People get that because they know what the bubbles look like, but they do not understand what just happened to a firm, for example, like buy now, pay later. They couldn't they they couldn't get their liquidity this week, right? Stock just gets pounded because they couldn't get their bond deal done. Um, they don't right. understand. Like, are you kidding me? Do you think people understand mortgage servicing, Chris? Like in the weeds, like you guys? No. <laughs> but it's all the same thing. You're stretching for yield. You know, yeah. you're if you create no yield, you're going to create bubbles not just in crypto, but in yeah, that's the whole point about the seizure of junk in that's the bond right. market. To me, that's the Fed's problem. And if, if there's a liquidity problem, they got to fix it. Well, you know, in the Bible, they use 6% as the rate of interest. <laughs> it's instructive because 6% is enough to keep most people happy. Yeah. But if you don't pay them something, uh, not that. only do you take cash flow out of the system, which I think is one of the biggest downsides, financial repression, right, uh, of uh, quantitative easing, but you also encourage people to create new games. So we have this combination of technology a dearth of investment opportunities, especially opportunities that are accessible for small investors, individuals. And so off we go, we have crypto. 
And crypto is basically speculating on the value of poker chips. We're not even playing poker. And many of the people in crypto, by the way, have a background in professional poker, which I think is interesting. <laughs> um, but, you know, this is another game. And this is what humans do. We create layers of leverage so that we can earn a living. Yeah. It's that's just a, a natural human tendency. I think, you know, if, if somebody who is now completely triggered because they're a maxi or they're a hornet or they got laser eyes, um, mm. like if you just take a step back and you haven't reduced your whole life and your future to hodling and you actually listen to what an industry veteran just said about human history all the way back to the Bible. It said, we bet, we take on lever bets, we take on speculative bets, we take on stupid bets, we take on good risk adjusted bets, we take on asymmetric bets. And again, that's all it is. It's not hope.com. You know, that's what the guy from, you know, Mike Saylor <laughs> called it. You know, he took his shitty tech company, bought a bunch of Bitcoins with it, levered it up and bought mm -hmm. hope.com as a, a, he bought the website, hope.com. You know, so you're trying to get people to believe in their bets. Well, people would think that only crypto or only main stocks did well last year. But that's no not true. No, no, uh, no, no, no. My friends at Western Alliance, for example, that bought one of the more interesting mortgage firms in the U.S. from Apollo, Amerihome, uh, did awesome. They outperformed crypto last year. Yeah. Well, you know, these guys make money. Um, there were a lot of other really conventional firms that had a little crypto paint sprayed on them. And they did amazingly too. There's a, another little bank called Silvergate that facilitates crypto transfers. The thing was trading 12 times book value. You know, the, the best performing bank in the US, by the way, is who, Keith, you know? I do, I do not know. American Express, big bank. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Six times book today. But, you know, the thing that I, another risk down the road that we should talk about that I'm sure you've got on your mind is what do we do with all these people who've been playing in crypto and alternative assets worldwide using VPNs and everything else to evade U.S. Uh, regulation who now have to do KYC and AML with FinCEN watching them for the Russia sanctions? Hmm. You know, how, how do you do KYC on a crypto trade before you do it? answer is you don't I, I don't mean i think if you ask most people that have a crypto account and you said what is kyc you would have a very low score on who could answer that question correctly let's just start with that i know but you know what again going back to your imagery of the hodler these people are about to learn because the funny thing is about blockchain everybody goes on about blockchain it's a wonderful map if you work for the internal revenue service <laughs> right i mean it's you got to eventually learn perfect about Drawdowns, crashes, taxes, regulation, like, hello, you know, this is like, a, and I'm not trying to shit on crypto. I mean, I, I, I mean, no. again, it's just the highest beta, you know, bet at the, at the casino. I mean, it's, and I love it if we're in economic acceleration quad two, where we can put on bets and actually make money. Mm -hmm. But in quad four, which we appropriately label as the disinflation and inflation at the same time of real growth slowing in this case precipitously i mean we're in we're in a very bad spot for people that had those levered bets even a month ago never mind three yes and and you also had a lot of people who had been lulled to sleep by the fed who had a significant market move between say christmas and the end of february right uh and were you know basically long and wrong yeah i mean that's i mean i, I go back to it like people you know, they'll just keep saying it until I'm on the wrong side of the grass, because it could very well be like the two, 1999, 2000 bubble with just different things that were the parts of the bubble. Like I said, it's 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 old, Chris, but it's always new, the things, but the, it's the same old behavior. November, November the 8th was the same day that the Russell 2000 peak as Bitcoin. Yeah. Now, I, we're not talking about a random index. We're talking about a very broad index of U.S. stocks. November the 19th, the NASDAQ peaked. November the 19th, Amazon peaked. Everybody's favorite place to shop and own the stock. You know, it's like, you know, so that was a point in economic time. Like you guys can show it on slide 16. Whether people like it or not, the Republican or Democrat, the economy was accelerating post Delta variant rolling over between September, late September and into November. It was one of the biggest Thanksgiving I've ever seen on the board in terms of economic data being reported in rate of change terms. So rate on the screws, Chris. Speculative bubbles peak when the rate of change of growth peaks. You know, speculative declines 
end in evisceration until the rate of change of growth stops slowing. You know, so, mm-hmm. you know, that's, you know, for me, that's, it's not trying to be permanently bullish on any asset. There's a price for everything. Um, but there's a storyline too. I wonder, I, I have this book, Chris, that I was going to ask you about that. I just, uh, one of our clients sent it to me. It's an old one that, uh, you know, you, do you know, you probably, you know, everybody, but uh, do you know Leon Levy? No, I've never met Leon. From, you know, he's one of the founders of Oppenheimer. Uh, he was the first one to get the SEC. You'll find this interesting because you're such a, a well-versed financial market and, you know, history at large historian, but he was the first guy to get the SEC to sign off on having a mutual fund that could short stocks. And Hang on a second. Jeez. So anyway, Levy, this book kind of goes through that where this guy, he knows, and this book was written in 2002. So written in 2002 is an important point in time because it was after the shit hit the fan, right? So everything that's hit, been hitting the fan since November the 8th in crypto space or everything NASDAQ since November the 19th, there's a point in time where guys like Chris and I have seen the other side. You know, the other side of those bubbles were what, what he was commenting on. And it was almost like a, I was reading this book, Chris, just going, the book was written in 2002 by a guy who's, you know, at, at that point, you know, one of the large long only funds, just reminding people how nonsensical the storytelling can be when you come out of an economic cycle peak. And it's one of the most basic lessons you can learn. But now my greatest fear is that all that is in financial products and levered products and illiquid products that aren't stocks. Like we're not, we're blowing up TAM stocks that go from 50 times revenue to eight times revenue. And then some 26 year old analyst is telling you that on his spreadsheet, it's cheap. I mean, that's not- They have to come up with something to say, Keith. (laughs) Right? Those guys are going away, by the way, um, those TAM analysts. Um, But the people that remember, again, this is, it takes, that's the whole point of Wall Street, isn't it? That we have to bring in a whole new cattle class of analysts that that didn't get fired yet, that make the same mistakes. Like you said, they're going to learn. Yeah, well, we'll see. You know, again, going back to the point I made earlier, when the central bank takes all of the yield, that is to say, all of the duration out of the market, then what you're basically saying is that volatility is infinite. Right. And that means that, sure, these things are going to go up and up as long as they can, housing, for example. But these other uh, securities, these other assets are not supported by scarcity the way housing is. You know, my my NVIDIA position, uh, which I've accumulated over many years, the damn stock uh, traded off by a third. Is there (laughs) anything wrong with the company? No. No. It's just everybody's worried about tech today. The but bank? people are apoplectic about that. I mean, if you look yeah. at something, um, let's let's take it to something that they wouldn't be looking at. And this this is where we already see liquidity issues. Um, you can look at it on market access, for example. If you want to try this with me, you, market access is where you know JNK, the junk bond ETF, HYG. You know, every day you can submit your bids and you can see if you get hit. And currently, like, try it. You know, if you can put a bit of a you know, point or two points below the market, Chris, and you're going to get hit because people are looking for liquidity. Um, oh, yeah. But if I look at the JNK and I go back to pre-pandemic, like just look at the stock price, just pull up a five-year chart, right? Pre-pandemic, this thing, it, you know, got up to, the economy was slowing, don't forget, in 2019. So, you know, people were trying to chase yield. So there, that's a stretch, right? When you're buying jump bonds. You know, if you go back to 2018, when the economic cycle peaked, the JNK was at like 90. Then as the economy, when the shit hit the fan, right, right above, before it hit the fan in, in, in 2020, it got up to, it was 10% higher than that. Then it was 10% higher than that after the pandemic. So you go from some, a, a bond index that's priced at 90 in, in ETF terms to almost 110. Yeah. And, and, and the first part of the correction is to 102. Ooh, like, what is it that, why wouldn't, why wouldn't, if the economy slows towards a recession or just slows to zero, towards one or zero percent, why wouldn't all the, all, all bond prices that became bubbles too, why wouldn't they go back to where they were? I think that's, that's the big question that's hanging over the markets today. We, you know, we, what, how much of this bubble was literally just due to the Fed and the liquidity and also the fiscal spend, keep in mind. You know, there were a lot of organizations that got free money during 2021 that didn't spend it. 
So if you look at the municipal market, there was almost no issuance. They basically just sat back. A lot of not-for-profits, the same thing. Well, now eventually they're going to have to start funding again at, at relatively normal rates. But there was a long period of time when there was nothing going on. So people who invested in that market had to go look somewhere else. Uh, and you have many other examples of this. So the discontinuities that have been created by our beloved civil servants at the Fed uh, are unknown. We don't know how it's going to work out. All we need is one nice juicy default on top of the Russian default, of course, uh, that's going to, I think, get people uh, scared. You see this in Asia. Look at the selling we've seen out of the Asian markets this week. Mm -hmm. um, and those are very speculative markets. You know, they're, they're like the United States 100 years ago, basically. That's what you've got going on in China. If you look at something local, like, you know, again, go rabbit hole if you want, because you see a lot of stuff. I mean, if, if you, you know, pick one, two or three parts of U.S. credit markets that you think are like, OK, it's just a ticking time bomb. I, I, I wouldn't say it's a ticking time bomb in terms of whole markets. There are different pieces of markets. Like there are That's some right. players in commercial real estate. Look at Brookfield with lots of downtown exposure in many cities around the U.S., uh, we'll see how that works out. Uh, my friends in that business say they're going to fill the buildings, but the question is what kind of rent are they going to get? And how is that going to affect the value of the asset if there's a significant amount of concessions needed to get smaller, you know, more numerous tenants into these buildings in New York City, for example? Um, and I, I can point to that all, you know, you look at just real estate in general. There are still some hot pockets of real estate around the country that are going to correct eventually. But, you know, well, I, I still don't think we'll see a correction in Resi until 2024, 25. Hmm. You run out of customers because the prices keep going up. You run out of customers. That's what happens. It, it, we're not going to get supply, unfortunately. Yeah, it takes a long time. I mean, particularly there. I mean, yeah, it's well, they, there's so many obstacles uh, to, to building affordable housing. Number one being inflation. Mm hmm. You know, yeah. Home builders have no incentive to build spec houses if they're not going to make money. Well, there's like my dad. My dad is a is a retired firefighter, so I was his like schlep. I would be building houses with him, you know, all the time. Like I doing all the crap jobs, like tarring the basement and carrying shit, and just just doing whatever he told me, banging the nails, obviously. But um, you know, most builders, you know, they work off again, some very basic assumptions, which is again, and it's really tight when those costs are rising. So the best way, and it's, it's no different than somebody who just blew up owning a bunch of TAM stocks. It's that if you lost money speculating on a, on a, on a new home build, you're not immediately going back to doing that if the Federal Reserve starts cutting interest rates. I mean, it's like, mm -hmm. like, like somebody said, um, uh, Ami Joseph, our tech software analyst said on the call the other day, he's like, yeah, you don't just snap back to 40 trading at 40 times revenues. I mean, no. <laughs> there's a lot of battle scars out there. Well, certainly not in financials. Um, you know, the banks have weathered the sell-off that we've seen in the past couple of months much better than the broad yeah. market. But still, um, I think you're going to see declining earnings and, and relatively flat to down revenue compared to the real benchmark. You know, we had two years of noise. So yep. you can basically throw 2021 into the waste can in terms of benchmarking the industry's performance. There were so many gap adjustments, uh, particularly banks pulling reserves back into income. It made income look better. Well, on that, I had one question for you. I don't know if you can see my screen, slide 56, guys, because uh, I'm, I'm short, I was shorting the financials today. I put out a note oh. by shorting the financials. Scam. Go you know, you know, pray for me. Uh, but, you know, if you look at this, like last year in the second quarter, financials, like we're talking about mainline, you know, headline sector ETF, 181% earnings growth in the second quarter. I mean, even, even if you aren't slowing, you're going to be looking like you're slowing precipitously on, like you said, revenues. Uh, the yeah. curve is obviously pancaked relative to where it was then. Uh, and your labor costs are straight up. So, you know, yeah. Like, why would you buy a bank stock, you know, particularly after it's bounced, like, into that? Look, look uh, the Fed can't subsidize operating expenses. And the most important metric for any big bank is operating efficiency. If you're not down in the 50% range somewhere, you're in trouble. Uh, you know, think about Bank of America, which is one of the most heavily traded large cap stocks 
yeah. in terms of volume. That bank has been dead in the water for 10 years under Brian Moynihan. Uh, when they got done paying the lawyers for the mortgage mess, suddenly their expenses dropped $20 billion and everybody got excited. And the <laughs> stock ran. You remember that. Yeah, yeah. But now, you know, it sits at the bottom of uh, its peer group. The financial performance of that institution is is just a tragedy. You know, you know that, uh, like if if I was just like I am, which is just you know not that intellectual, uh, I just overlaid J and K because it was the last sticker I had in, in my system, and I overlaid it with BAC. Yeah, exact same fractal pattern, exact right. same thing. Isn't that interesting, right? It's pro cyclical, right? You you you. you you highly value a bank and its and its credit worthiness as you would a junk bond in terms of its cash flows and its credit credit worthiness. You, so you want to have some fun? Compare Bank America to Silvergate SI. Oh, okay, let's have some fun. Look at that. <laughs> all you have to do with a, a little community bank from Costa Mesa is add some uh, crypto. Oh, there we go. Now oh. that. That one, this is the beauty of the new ideas, the new, That's the new, right. which new ideas. What we're talking about old behaviors, but new permutations, crypto, railways, you know, like tulips. Um, people are going to get so upset with us. But um, yeah, the problem with that one is I can't pull up a five year chart because it's only not even two years old, man. <laughs> I know, I know. But it, it's, uh, it followed Tesla beautifully. If you oh, compare definitely. all of these meme stocks to the king of meme, which is Tesla, um, I, I would say that they all pretty much look the same. Oh, Tesla. Oh, Tesla looks like junk bonds and Bank of America. Look at that. Look at that. It peaked in quad two, <laughs> rolled over hard. But now it's OK. It's OK because somebody's going to put a 6,000 target on the S&P 500 and it's going to magically go there. No. No, 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 no. Um, all right. Do you want? Do you want to get some other other people's questions? Um, sure. Because um, I, I, I do want to come back to if we don't get questions from the audience on this on this on what the future state of, of bank earnings are going to be with the current cost. Actually, let's just do that one first. Like what? Like let's use Bank of America now that now that the year over year legal comps have been you know worked yes. through. What, what does the future state look like on the labor line of running a large bank? Well, they're going to have, continue to have very low credit costs for a little while, most of this year. So that's not going to be a drag. The real issue for banks is what happens to funding? If you start seeing any increase in funding costs, they're not going to make it back on the loan side in terms of the pricing of loans. And they're not really going to make it back much on securities. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I wrote a fairly critical note of TD the other day because it's a big Canadian bank and they buy another U.S. bank and they can't even lend them the deposits they have. Half of that book is in securities. And guess what? They're not making much money. Really? So, the Canadians bought, what was it, Horizon or something? Some U.S. Uh, first Horizon, the first old one? first Tennessee business. Uh, okay. $100 so billion dollars in core deposits that they don't need. Because, you know, basically the Canadians are asset managers. So they're not very good bankers and they have never had success in the United States. Never. All of the Canadian invasions of the U S community banking market have ended up badly. So now that, uh, I'm going to piss some more people off. I mean, from crypto, let's go to Can Canadian bankers. I mean, I'm Canadian, which you probably know. Um, it's like, it's where you send like your third tier. It's like, it's, it's like junior C hockey, like, you know, where, you know, you got, you got the league is wall street. And if you really can name your place, you might work in London. But, you know, if you get sent to run a Canadian bank, hmm, you're, uh, you know, and now Canadian banks are going to buy a, a bank from Tennessee. That's interesting. That's uh, you They've should been be buying them all the time. You know, who's leaving is Banco Santander. They, they have figured out that they should get out of the bank business and just do auto loans. Oh, non-bank. So non-bank finance, if you do it right is much more profitable than your typical community bank. Um, but it takes a different skill set, different risk management skills, particularly. Yeah, did you, uh, I guess maybe there is some pro-cyclical irony, not irony, but, you know, pro-cyclical behavior there. If you look at the used car index, have you seen that bubble chart? We'll just show it to everybody. The Mannheim index. Slide That's six. Right. That thing is a beauty. Well, bank loans on autos, the prime auto stuff they do, 
the the loss given default is almost zero. Is it? Yeah, because you use car prices. Yeah. Like take the car and sell it. You know, somebody ships it to Africa or something. I don't know. So again, it gets back to the point you made earlier, fundamentally, but collateral, right? I mean, it's yes. like, and for a lot of people with low incomes, that is their their most liquid asset. It's the- Oh, you know, very much. And it's typically, you know, they don't wait around when you're late on your car loan, they go take the car. <laughs> you know, it, it resolves itself within 60 days. I love how you just boil down, like you, you can speak at the most sophisticated level and teach people through that. And then you're just like boiling it down. It's like- I have a friend who used to do this. He'd come up to your house at 10 o'clock at night, pull your garage door off, take the car. What, the repo man? I, oh, I'm, yeah. I'm the garage of, door does not protect you from the repo man in the state of Maryland. No, those no. are my buddies. I like repo guys. Those kinds of repo guys. All yeah. right, let's get to the let's get to the questions. Actually, here's and the first question is from a from a gentleman in North Carolina, uh, John in North Carolina. Outside of the rate hike, you know, and he, I guess he's got the same point here. Like whatever it is, you know, what other speech from Powell or or other people at the Fed are are you paying close attention to? Uh, we in my blog yesterday we cited um, an important Fed official, uh, Lori. I can't remember her last name. Just blanked on me. But the Fed of New York has been very, um, I think, responsibly giving us guidance on what they're going to do with the portfolio. Mm -hmm. And what they have said is that they're not planning on any outright sales. They're just going to let the bonds run off as they mature. So we'll see. But that, to me, is the most important thing to watch. If you go find that page on the Fed of New York uh, website, just keep an eye on that, because if they make a change and start indicating outright sales are needed to hit the committee targets for portfolio shrinkage, uh, then they're going to let you know. Now, why is this important? Because for every dollar that runs off the Fed's book in that portfolio of bonds they own, you lose a dollar of bank deposits. Mm. And it's a one-to-one -one relationship. Now, remember what happens. I buy a bond from, uh, you know, I buy a bond at my bank. My bank sells the bond to the Fed and they give me cash, right? And so eventually, either I go out and buy another bond or I buy another asset, right? But if I'm the Fed, the Treasury pays me back and I don't immediately buy another bond from the Treasury. The Treasury has to go out and sell that bond to somebody else. And, that, and that's why the mechanics of quantitative easing are so treacherous for the Fed, because it's and, and, impossible and, and, for them to measure liquidity. How do you measure liquidity? I actually also, suggested that one of our colleagues in the media should ask Powell that. One it, sentence answer, Mr. Powell, how do you measure liquidity? You, you, you're not going to get the right questions ever. But <laughs> that's uh, again, just boiling it down for people, that's important. And, and you're right, they do show their hand. I mean, uh, I'll never forget. I mean, now it's history, but I mean, when the Dallas Fed put out that paper, which we've been talking about for a decade on how home price inflation leads OER, you know, in the inflation calculation, yeah. and how that alone was going to get CPI to six, seven percent. And then lo and behold, the Dallas Fed wrote a paper about it. Right as the guy was getting ejected from his seat for trading, as like, okay, now they know. <laughs> Isn't right? it amazing that they even had that problem? <laughs> It just it boggles my mind because you know I worked at the Fed years ago and they had policies about this stuff a long time ago, yeah. but somehow or another it didn't apply to governors. I guess. I mean, I guess not. I mean, it's um, it's frightening on a lot of levels. Um, oh, oh, by the way, question on um, did you did you were you surprised at all by what happened with Raskin yesterday on the Fed uh, proposed Fed appointment? Um, I was happy to see it happen. I think it was inappropriate for them to propose this well-known industry lawyer who represented banks and financial companies to take charge of regulatory policy. That's right. tough. Because what happens if she's in front of a client? She's got to recuse herself? I think it would have been better to just propose Raskin as a governor and mm -hmm. find somebody who didn't have so many direct conflicts in terms of their, their professional life. You know, yeah. it's, you don't want even the appearance of conflict when it comes to bank supervision. That's supposed to be an area of the Fed that nobody hears about. And I think the oil industry obviously wasn't supporting her because they thought she was going to become yet another one of these people who wants to turn the Fed into an environmental agency. Um, <laughs> you know, but you know what? Come November, Keith, we're going to solve this problem. If you see the photographs of Nancy Pelosi recently, this is somebody who is in dread. 
about the future. And I think she's going to end up retiring after November. Hmm, that's interesting. Um, all right, we're gonna we have some time for a couple more questions. Um, Tim in St. Louis, you know, are we asking about other issues? You know, other failures this time around, and he's asking about these rocket mortgage companies. Do you think that these things could go to towards bankruptcy? Oh no, no, no! Rocket is one of the preeminent uh, non-bank lenders in the country. They have so much cash on their balance sheet; they don't need to borrow from banks to fund their production. Yeah. Uh, very efficient, very well run, run business. Mark Gilbert, you know, uh, wonderful executive, built the whole uh, yeah. series of companies. You know, he's been enormously generous in Detroit. So I, I wouldn't worry about Rocket, Penny Mac, those guys. They're all very solid. The top 10, who mostly are the ones who service loans, they own right. the servicing, they're okay. The banks will finance them. No, that the, business, the little guys uh, are the ones you worry about. Yeah, that business, we have clients there. And there's a reason why in Detroit, they call it the mortgage city instead of the motor city all of a sudden. I mean, these guys are making a yeah. lot of money and there's a right. lot of companies doing well that, are, that work for these companies. And there's a, a couple of other firms besides Rocket. You know, you have Flagstar, which yeah. is a relatively small bank, but it's one of the biggest servicers in the country. Hmm. Uh, very well-run institution, top performer, by the way, 20% equity returns. That'll, that'll get you up in the morning. I like that. I like that. I, I like those double digit equity returns. Chip <laughs> it in. Uh, this is just like a, a, a very simple question with not a simple answer, but how quickly do you think the Fed would pivot to easing? Oh, overnight. If, if there's a big <laughs> enough pickup. Well, like I said before, though, they're not going to start buying long-term bonds for the portfolio. They're going to dump more, uh, cash in the short end through repurchase agreements. Now, that assumes that you have collateral, right? Right. But for people who've got collateral, there will be liquidity. For people who don't, that's where the risk is, Keith. Yeah, this is where um, this, you and I are not consensus on this. I just want people to make sure that they heard that. You know, two guys going back and forth, talking in a bar or here in libraries with the dogs barking and everything else. Um, it's we do not. Chris and I are not consensus on this. Most no. institutional clients I talk to, Chris, are like they're like, no way they turn around with inflation where it is ahead of the midterms. Blah, 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 blah. And I just disagree with it. I, I think that they I, I well, would we live in strange times. You know, the, the tale of two cities uh, introduction comes back to me over and over. Um, I'll give you an example. My brother, Michael Whalen, is a very well-known songwriter, composer, and he knows some of these private equity guys that have been buying catalogs from aging rock and rollers at very substantial prices. Oh, really? What? Yes. Yeah. And he thinks they're crazy, by the way. So one day he's got one of the big guys on the phone and he's very unhappy because Michael's been critical of a, a transaction. And so Michael says, wait a minute, calls his assistant into the room and says, can you name any of the songs by so-and-so? And this, you know, 20 something draws a total blank. And so what he was trying to say to these guys is, is that the customers, the people who, you know, value these intangible assets are dwindling. And if you think you're going to be able to monetize a $300 million investment in a portfolio of songs that no 25 year old has ever heard, uh, that's a problem. But this is part and parcel of quantitative easing, you know? This is the gift of Chairman Powell. Yeah, he. Uh, it's <laughs> one of my good friends, by the way. Is uh, I don't know if, if you if you're a '80s rock fan, but Ian O'Malley, who's one of the great DJs in New York City, uh, mm -hmm. Canadian guy, good good guy from the East Coast of Canada. But uh, yeah, he and I are like to talk about this these kinds of things all the time. I mean, it's it's you're right. You know, it's, they're they're generational, obviously. Um, you know, they're looking for stuff to buy. There's a yeah. whole segment of private equity now that's buying catalogs of aging rock and rollers. Yeah. <laughs> you know, even Paul McCartney, who I love, would you buy his catalog for half a billion dollars? I mean, it's it's part of the fourth turning too. You know, Neil Howe writes about this. I mean, it is the you know, the 1980s are, are a time in US economic history that people are quite fond of, particularly even Gen Xers like me will be happy about that, right? I mean, sure. Uh, yeah, it's the, the good time. Look at the economics of content. Okay. It's not getting better. In fact, one of the great predictions my brother made is that eventually all the legacy TV programs would have to be aggregated on the one website. <laughs> 
and we still love them. It's not like we don't want to watch Leave it to Beaver, right? But, you know, there's a limited audience for this stuff. Yeah, that is uh, that is interesting. Um, our, and people have so many thoughts on that, you know, through NFTs and everything else. It's, it's, it's Look, amazing. we're buying real estate online. We're buying pictures of dogs. This, this is... A, <laughs> all right. Come on. This last question, this is a good one. I just came in. I think it's, 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 uh, I like the simple ones. And this is uh, from a Norwegian who lives in DC. All right. So he, mm. he, he's asking if this is the shortest business cycle yet, like if we're, if we're saying it's long and it's over, is that it? Is that, is it, is that the end of it? Well, that's a very good question again, because of the volatility business cycles are going to be a matter of weeks. <laughs> You know, the economists are, are not even going to be able to keep up with the commentary. Because think about the last two months. Everything you wrote last year, you can forget. Yeah. Everything. Yeah, Doesn't literally. Li literally, like for somebody who measures and maps it like a total nerd, you know, beam counting that slide 16 every single day with my team. You know, it is the opposite, Chris, in, you know, in terms of the February data versus where it was in November. Literally the opposite. That, you know, so, okay. And yep. this is with Omicron rolling off, you know, some people are looking for the Omicron bounce. There was no bounce. No, no. Yeah. So, all right. Well, well I think you, and I, you and I had to get off. We have two, but two minutes before our overlords determine our fate. And uh, I thank you for, <laughs> I thank you for your candidness and, and all your wisdom. You you're, you're very good at educating the audience and, and you're a favorite over here. So thanks for your time. Thank you, Keith.